Hello, I'd like to welcome and thank all of you for coming to our program today. It's co-sponsored by the New School for Analytical Psychology and the Society for the Anthropology of Consciousness. We have a great turnout and we're just really pleased. My name is Kenneth Kimmel. I'm a co-founder and faculty of the New School. And today we're pleased to present Two-Eyed Seeing, Indigenous Approaches to Healing Trauma with Dr. Luis Mel Madrona and Barbara Manji. I'll be moderating the question and answer discussions today. And um, as your questions or comments come up in the one hour to 75 minute uh, talk, uh, please enter them in the chat box and we'll take them in the order received. Um, so there'll be about a 15 minute break after the, uh, after the talk, and then we'll do a question and answer after that. And we're gonna ask you to mute yourselves um, during uh, the talk and only unmute yourself when your question is up and we'll ask you to present your, your question to the presenters. Um, before I turn things over to editor of the Society for Anthropology of Consciousness, Nicole Torres, to introduce our guest speakers, I'd like to say a few words about the new school. The new school for analytical psychology was founded in Seattle in 2014 by four Jungian analysts. It came into being out of a response to what they perceived as a fundamentalism and hierarchical misuse of power in their former institute that compelled them to leave. This is common in many institutions, including psychoanalytic ones. The exclusion or appropriation of human differences, distinctiveness, and otherness. It is for that reason our school does not hold fast to a single theory or ideology. We value the principles of intellectual freedom and inclusion. Our faculty comprises psychoanalysts and psychotherapists from diverse schools of thought, anthropologists, philosophers, theologians, artists, and at least one mystic at heart. As a co-founder of the new school, Ladson Hinton writes in the acknowledgement to his new edited edition entitled Shame, Temporality and Social Change, Ominous Transitions, quote, the core purpose of the new school is giving voice to a multidisciplinary analysis and critique of the basic concerns of our times. And for those of you too, new to our school, if you'd like to receive our announcements of future programs, please be sure to go onto the website to be placed on the mailing list. Thank you. Nicole? Hi, and thank, thank you, Ken. And thank you all for attending and for being here with us. And we, the Society for the Anthropology of Consciousness, we're definitely glad to be co-sponsors of this event. Just to give you some background about the society, um, we are a section of the American Anthropological Association, and we are also an interdisciplinary group of scholars and practitioners who utilize cross-cultural, experimental, exper experiential, and theoretical approaches to studying consciousness as a fundamental component of the universe. And this includes indigenous as well as psychoanalytic perspectives, among many, many other things. And Andrew, if you're up to it, you can drop the website, our website, into the chat box. Um, if you are a clinician and you need CEUs, please follow the instructions that I sent in an email. Um, you, should you should have received that in your inbox about an hour ago. If you registered this morning, I will send you the email for CEUs later. So we are happy to welcome uh, Dr. Louis Mel Madrona and Barbara Mangi as our guest today. Um, Lewis is the author of Coyote Medicine, Coyote Healing, and Coyote Wisdom. 
focusing on what Native culture has to offer the modern world. He has also written Narrative Medicine, Healing the Mind Through the Power of Story, the Power of the Promise of Narrative Psychiatry, and his most recent book with Barbara Mengi, Remapping Your Mind, The Neuroscience of Self-Transformation Through Story. Dr. Mel Madrona graduated from Stanford University School of Medicine and completed his residencies in family medicine and in psychiatry at the University of Vermont College of Medicine. He has been on the, on the faculties of several medical schools, most recently as the Associate Professor of Family Medicine at the University of New England. Barbara Mangi is a licensed clinical social worker. She studied psychology and philosophy at the University of Toronto and received her master's degree in creative arts psychotherapy at Concordia University in Montreal. She has co-written also Remapping Your Mind um, with, with Dr. Mel Madrona and current, currently she is completing her Master's of Fine Art in Documentary Filmmaking at York University, Toronto and is also working with Lewis in Orono, Maine. She is the Director of Education for the Coyote Institute in Orono. So thank you for being here with us and we're honored to have you here and I will turn it over to you. Great, thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to focus on two-eyed seeing and Barbara is going to bring in the trauma aspect of two-eyed seeing. So, um, and of course, this is a picture of Barbara at our favorite odds and ends store uh, next to that castle that you can see on the left, which is in Najak, a place called Najak. And this is how to get a hold of us for me at least. Um, so I want to thank Albert Marshall for bringing two-eyed seeing into the English-speaking world. In Mi'kmaq, his language, it's Eptuoptimunk. And we sit on the original land of the Wabanaki people, the people of the Don. And so we want to acknowledge the Wabanaki. And I want to thank New School and Nicole and the people I'm just meeting, Ken et al., and the Society for the Anthropology of Consciousness for having me. And I thought we were, you guys were in California, but it sounds like you're in Seattle. So <laughs> I don't know where you are. <laughs> but wherever you are, thanks, thanks to the indigenous people of that place. So... Um, so my journey to two-eyed seeing, or what's also called explanatory pluralism, began at Stanford University School of Medicine. And it began really for me as a, as a sudden shift of consciousness that happened in a lecture given by um, the guy who discovered the metabolic syndrome. And he said to us that life was a relentless progression toward death, disease, and decay. And the job of the physician is to slow the rate of decline. And I thought, that's not what my great grandmother said. And so I was immediately confronted by two perspectives on healing and health, and two perspectives on aging, because my, my grandmother and my great-grandmother believed that, they didn't believe that you had to be sick to die, and they didn't believe that being sick would kill you. They believed that, that the two were very separate, and that their ideal was to die healthy so you could party with your relatives when you got to the other side. And so this notion of death, disease, and decay would would not have sat well with them. And so after the lecture, I ran over to the Stanford Indian Center, which in those days was in the old firehouse. And I burst into the room and who was at the, the desk but Henrietta Blue Eyes. And, and I ran up to her and I said, Henrietta, I need an elder. And, and she produced one of those archaic 
um, devices that now belong in museums called a Rolodex. And she went through it and, and she said, what tribe? And I said, Cherokee. And she, and she gave me two names, one in Ukiah and one in Garberville. And I was spending time with elders by the next weekend in order to keep my indigenous eye open so that, so that the biomedical eye would not force it closed. And so that, that was really my beginning of two-eyed seeing. And um, also at Stanford, I got to go to my first Anipi Chaga, which Anipi, um, Ini means to breathe. And P means, P is the plural, third person plural. So Inipi or Anipi means they breathe. And Kaga is a ceremony. So it means um, they breathe ceremony or ceremony in which they breathe. And, it, and that breathing refers to um, the breath of life, which is the steam coming off the stones when you go inside. And so um, my first in Ipichaga happened on the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. Uh, a friend from medical school brought me home with him to his reserve. And who should I meet before I went in? But Father Stone. And um, I said, wow. I said, I didn't expect no Catholics here. And he said, oh yeah. He said, I go to all their ceremonies. And he showed me his collar and he said, and I bring my collar because you know, if the police come and try to arrest them, I'll just announce that it's a proper Catholic ceremony. And in those days, of course, this was illegal. It was illegal to do in Ipikagas because all Native American ceremonies were banned. And that had changed in Canada in 1960, but it did not change in the United States until 1978. So um, Father Stone was fun. And, and he confided to me, he said, you know, he said, I, I have to tell you, he said, I kind of like their stuff better than my stuff, he said, but they're really nice to me. They come to all my masses too, you know. He said, I, got a, I even got an award from the Pope for having the most Indians in mass. So, uh, so he was kind of a cool guy, but uh, th so that was too I'd seeing because Father Stone could see the world through his Catholic eye and he could see the world through the Shoshone Arapaho eye. And he could hold both of those visions at the same time. So um, another story, and Barbara may chime in on this story because she knows Becky well. Um, so Becky is a friend of ours and Becky um, unfortunately was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And she was told that there was basically no hope for her, go home and die. Um, and so instead of going home and dying, she went home to Native American church. And um, Native American church is a complicated story that we don't have time to talk about. But briefly, it, it arose in the late 1890s. And it came from a Winnemucca guy, if I'm remembering correctly, a Paiute in a Northern Cheyenne. And, um, and it, it's a, an amazing ceremony. It's done in a teepee. And it's, it's designed so that if the police or the army show up, that everything can be taken apart to look like it's a bunch of people sitting around cooking around a fire. That's how they dealt with the fact that it was illegal to do this ceremony. And um, here's, here's the, what the inside looks like. You can see the water drum and you just pull the top off and it looks like a cooking pot. And you can see the, these um, rattles are designed so that you can stir stuff with them at the other end. And uh, it's, it's really quite ingenious how they did that. And um, so anyway, um, I think it's been about 15 years and they still haven't found 
Becky's pancreatic cancer, it, it must be wandering around somewhere in South Dakota because, you know, nobody's been able to track it down. And uh, it, was, it was quite a process of healing. And, um, and part of the deal was that she had to give something back. So she couldn't just be healed. She had to make an offering. And she had to continue to make that offering every day of her life if she wanted to stay well. And so her offering is, is, is her participation in healing and working with her own community. So she, with her husband, Dallas, um, Dallas Chief Eagle, she opened the All Nations Healing Center and, uh, and they, they, uh, they regularly invite people to ceremony and take care of, uh, take care of their community. So, so, that was a, an example of one-eyed seeing because the, the doctors couldn't see, the doctors in Rapid City, couldn't see that there was a, any other option for her. There was only death. That was all they could see. And um, luckily for all of us, that didn't happen. So, um, so the basic story is that indigenous people had been concerned with healing and with healing from trauma, with, with emotional well-being, which I've, been, which I've learned is a better translation than mental health. And so I'm, I'm trying to replace mental health on everything with emotional well-being. And, and our problem, the problem that faced Albert Marshall, who started Two-Eyed Seeing, was that the dominant paradigm dismisses indigenous wisdom as unscientific, lacking in evidence. And of course, the dominant paradigm is positivistic, it's reductionistic, and some other things that I dare not say in mixed company. And so Albert's point of view is that indigenous wisdom has something to offer the modern world, and he wanted to bring that forth. And, and he wanted to say that indigenous knowledge is just as valid as any other knowledge. And of course, this is true for, indige for Aboriginal indigenous people, but also for any marginalized people, for um, LGBTQ individuals, for immigrants, for the homeless, for voice hearers, you know, that, that everyone has wisdom and their wisdom should not be dismissed. And that's the point of two-eyed seeing. So, eptuoptamonk in Mi'kmaq. And, and so, um, Albert believes that the dominant culture actually needs the wisdom of indigenous people for survival. That it's indigenous perspectives that humanize biomedical approaches and that the two could, could do well together, could be better than one alone. And of interest is that for the Mi'kmaq, seven generations is 840 years. For the Lakota, it's only 120 years. <laughs> we're, we're a little behind the Mi'kmaq. And, and, but the point is that um, we should leave the world a better place. We should always try and improve on things. And here's Albert. And he's a little older than this now. He's over 80, pushing 85, and going strong. And so um, Albert brings another concept to, uh, to us, another Mi'kmaq concept, which is Natukalimk. And this is the, the idea, the Mi'kmaq idea, that we are interdependent and interconnected with the natural and the spiritual world. And these are key concepts in Mi'kmaq as well as Lakota, and I believe in most indigenous cultures. And the parallel in um, mainstream culture would be system science, uh, of which ecology is one branch. And um, so two-eyed seeing is about always looking for another way to look at things. And with the idea that 
The other way might be a better way. And so we have to be open to all perspectives. And it sounds like that's what you guys are doing at the new school, is, is allowing multiple visions to coexist. And when we have that kind of diversity, we have tremendous possibilities for creativity. So, um, so we want to take the best of all worlds. And, you know, I have to say that, that Western, well, it, maybe we should say biomedicine because it exists in Asia as well and Africa. So biomedicine does some things really well. Um, you know, if, if you're in a terrible car accident, they can patch you up pretty good. And if you need uh, a hip replacement, they're pretty good at that too. Um, but there's some things that they're terrible at. And so there's some things that indigenous people are better at. And just a, a, a quick funny story about that. So uh, Barbara and I have a shared client. And um, so when she came to see me three months ago, her, her hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker for severity of diabetes, was 11.4, which is tremendously high. And so we all rallied around her and we said, hey, you know what? You got diabetes. She's like, no, I don't. And we're like, yes, you do. And, and so a whole team came together, you know, to, to help her change her lifestyle. So case managers were involved. Barbara got involved um, and um, a nutritionist got involved. And in three months, she had it down to 8.4, which is an amazing drop. Now, the, the only medication she was taking was a little metformin. So um, three months ago, our pharmacist, our clinical pharmacist, had just been nagging me like, nobody's business to put her on like tons of medications. And I said, no, you know, a little metformin is all we're going to do. And we're going to do lifestyle. And she's like, well, 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 well. And so anyway, I sent her a note um, and I said, look what lifestyle accomplished. And so she wrote me back and she said, isn't it amazing what metformin can do sometimes? And, and, and then she, she said, now here's a whole bunch of other drugs that'll further lower the hemoglobin A1C. And I sent it around, I sent a response to some of my colleagues and I said, isn't it terrible where medicine has come? I mean, look at this, not even an acknowledgement of the tremendous lifestyle change that this woman made and the possibility that her exercising and changing her diet had some impact on her diabetes and not the metformin. So that's one I'd see. And we want to do two I'd see. And um, so part of this too is about creating ethical space um, within the relationship between indigenous people and mainstream cultures. And Albert and his wife Merdina would say that we need to cultivate tribal consciousness. So, and of course, there's so many stories, so many indigenous stories from so many cultures that privilege altruism over selfishness and collectivism over individualism. And we may need some of that these days. Um, we, we may need to bring the human element back into science. So, um, indigenous knowledge then comes from consensus-driven systematic observations of how things work um, with, a, a, by consensus-driven, I mean that people sit around and, and talk about these things and figure out, you know, if the observations are valid or not. They're not just um, fly by the, by the night sort of, of, of suppositions. And um, Two-Eyed Seeing says that indigenous explanations don't have to make sense to the dominant paradigm to be effective and practical to work. So our enemy is positivism. It's the idea that there's one cause 
and the scientific method will, will find it. And that explanations are mutually exclusive. So that a full explanation of an event precludes any other full explanation of that event. And two-eyed seeing says, no way, Jose. There's, you know, there can be multiple full explanations. And you pick the one that works for the problem at hand in the context in which you find yourself. So biomedicine, reductionism, that the best theory is the micro theory. So microstructural theories are inherently better than macro theories. And, um, you know, the, the counter argument is that no matter how much I know about neural circuitry of depression and the neurochemicals involved, it doesn't explain why relationship and talking together within that relationship makes people feel a whole lot better. And nor does it explain the beneficial effects of meditation just because you know which brain circuits are involved. So reductionism isn't always the best possible solution. <clears throat> so explanatory pluralism. We can have multiple levels of explanation. We choose according to utility and aesthetics matching our explanation to our context. And we may need more than one explanation. So, um, so I wanted to just mention that there is some, some um, published articles that relate to this. I'm not gonna really go into them, but um, I often talk to, what's the word? Um, Physicians, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And, and they have to know that you have research. So <clears throat> this is an example of, of a, a kind of study that's looking at um, bringing traditional cultural healing into substance abuse treatment. And so two-eyed seeing in this context means taking the best from both worlds and in in the work that Barbara and I do, it could mean um, medication assisted treatment with you know, um, using uh, Suboxone to help someone to stay away from heroin while at the same time taking them to ceremony, uh, doing talking circles, having them in beating groups, um, singing, praying, smudging and, and all the rest. So two-eyed seeing, we can do more than just one thing. And um, this was a, a, a study I looked at, at at the effectiveness of using traditional cultural healing for chronic illness. And, and what I found was that everyone's just looking for what works. And people who have chronic illness don't actually care um, what makes them better if they get better that for the most part, um, when they go for alternative or complementary medicine or traditional cultural healing, it's because the simple approach, taking a pill, which sounds easy, didn't work. And so they're looking for something more. And so uh, two-eyed seeing, three-eyed seeing, four-eyed seeing, many-eyed seeing. And, you know, I, I tell, um, residents that I'm teaching that um, if allopathic medicine was so great, complementary and alternative medicine wouldn't exist. Because if there was a pill you could take that would solve all your woes, everyone would take it. And that would be the end of that, but apparently not. Um, we also looked, about, looked at how elders thought um, people should learn counseling if they're going to work with indigenous people. And, and the essence was two-eyed seeing, that they needed to be open to the traditional cultural ways as well as whatever they were learning in their graduate program. And uh, this was a study we did of bringing traditional cultural elders into uh, working with domestic violence situations. 
and we found that when we brought in the elders that um, we had much more success in, in eliminating domestic violence than when we just did the standard approach. So again, two-eyed seeing. And um, this was a paper from the Anthropology of Consciousness that uh, I did with a graduate student of mine about looking at how in indigenous or aboriginal people think about mind and emotional well-being. So, so how do we summarize all this? Well, um, that we are, we become what we are through our relationships and that relationships are managed through stories and that stories give us meaning and purpose. And um, this is a really marvelous little book by Joanne Archibald called Indigenous Story Work. And, and she talks about, she writes about how indigenous oral stories nurture knowledge systems and are knowledge systems. And she writes about the seven principles of indigenous story work, which are respect, responsibility, reciprocity, reverence, holism, interrelatedness, and synergy. So these are cool ideas. So indigenous knowledge about mental health, we learn to be who we are. We're not born that way. We're born into relationships that determine who we come through the stories that are told in the context where they're told and the stories that we incorporate and enact. And another way of thinking about this is that the conclusion, the point, the moral of a story could be called a belief. And this is where you can hook up indigenous knowledge with cognitive behavior therapy. So stories lead to beliefs. And it's a lot easier to change a belief by changing a story than to, than to bat around the belief with a stick. So, um, so in, in Lakota world, we talk about the Nahi, which is all those things that influence a person. And the, the concept is one of a swarm, like a swarm of bees, but a swarm of stories. Um, stories that, that have made us, that will make us, past, present, and future stories, um, ancestral stories, cultural stories, um, all of the stories that shape and influence us surround us like a swarm. And each story contains a spark of the being who told that story. And so there's a spark, a little tiny piece of every being who told every story that's swarming around us. So it's, it's a concept of non-local mind, mind outside the body. And it all happens in community. So it all happens in a, a circular world and not a linear world. And there's a, a marvelous book by Donald Fixico, uh, American Indian Mind in a Linear World. And he talks about this problem of, of circular thinking in a linear world and how, you know, how to struggle to connect those two worlds is hard. So, um, and elders, of course, are the knowledge carriers. And they are educated through an oral tradition. And everybody knows who they are within a community, though they don't actually have anything on their wall or hanging over their door that says who they are. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit about some elders that I have known and um, their contribution to two-eyed seeing. So one of the uh, most amazing human beings that I've ever met is Vern Harper, who has been, and he may still be, um, the elder in residence for CAMH in Toronto, 
the Center for Addictions and Mental Health Hospital, <clears throat> which is the largest psychiatric hospital in Canada. And um, one of the most amazing experiences you can ever have in your life is to sit with Vern and, and allow him to listen to you. There's never been a deeper listening than I've ever experienced in my whole life. And what Vern does once a week, he goes to the worst part of town and he sits with people and he just listens to them. He doesn't try and change them. He doesn't preach at them. He doesn't do motivational interviewing. <laughs> he doesn't do anything but listen. And, and he, he performs in the manner that Jacques Lacan recommended when he said that the greatest gift you can give someone is to listen without judgment or interpretation. And of course, Vern said that, that if, you, if, you, if you really want to engage in healing, you have to cover the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual dimensions. And a couple of other people's people. John Charles is, was an amazing man. He's crossed over now. But uh, John Charles is another example of two-eyed seeing. And um, John was diagnosed with glioblastoma multiforme at age 60, which is a, a really terrible malignant brain tumor. And John went to the doctors in Saskatoon and they told him he probably had about a month. There was nothing they could do for him. Now the interesting thing about John is that he was an Anglican priest as well as being by birth Cree. <clears throat> so John was in a quandary because no amount of Anglican ceremony or praying had helped him. And so people told him about a Cree healer, traditional healer. And he went to see her and he started working with her and he did everything she said. And again, you know, he misplaced his brain tumor. And um, when I met him, it had been 15 years since his diagnosis and he was going strong. And um, he told me that, that, you know, he was in a terrible dilemma because he'd spent a great part of his life studying the Anglican ways. And now he'd found healing through the Cree way. And, and he didn't know what to think. And, and so he, one night he had a dream. And in, in his dream, he dreamed of Christ on the cross, surrounded in the four directions by elders smoking their sacred pipes or chinupas. And, and in that moment of being in that dream, he realized that it was all one. It was just different symbol systems. And he could do both. And he didn't have to choose. And, and so from that time on, he did both. And he was comfortable being entirely in one or entirely in the other or blending them. Whatever way you went, John would go that way. And, and that was amazing too, I'd seeing. And I, I used to take people to, for, for him to doctor on Sunday mornings, you know, and, and uh, he would hold clinic. And then afterwards we would do an Anipi Kaga ceremony. And in, this was on Sturgeon Lake First Nation. And after the ceremony, there was always sturgeon to eat, yum caught in the lake. So um, four directions. And there's, there's always different symbols for this concept of balance and harmony. So um, Barbara, whenever you wanna jump in with two-eyed seeing as it relates to trauma with uh, maybe threat power meaning network, you know, yeah, I probably... I yeah, I, go could, for I, it. I, I could do that. So I wanted to to um, start by um, talking about um, 
What, so our friend Renee, Renee Linklotter, who's from Rainy River, she's a Rainy River Cree woman, and she is uh, in charge of Aboriginal relationships um, at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto. And she has been working, she, she wrote a book, Decolonizing Trauma Work, um, which was, uh, is a really wonderful intervention. And it coincides with a lot of the work that is being done on trauma and intergenerational trauma, which has, uh, has been happening recently. And um, basically, to be very brief, and um, uh, it, the, our nervous systems develop when we're starting from when we're in the womb. And we are, uh, are working to be able to correctly assess threat. And this takes place in a constellation of, of biology, biopsychosocial, cultural, and spiritual um, activities. So our mother's threat, our mother's um, anxiety level, uh, the timing of anxiety and stress on a mother during the developmental process in utero, the, um, the ability of, of people to self-regulate all contribute to the very beginnings of, of how our own threat detection system works. And our threat detection system is, is how we find out how to bond with other people, establish trust, and move in the world in a way that we feel confident that our that our actions can can uh, can work. And so, um, when we if our mother is stressed and she's very stressed at certain times during gestation, uh, it actually affects the, um, the 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 child's stress modifying system, which is the hypothalamus pituitary axis and leaves the, leaves the baby without uh, the resources to manage stress biologically. That is what is the, under, uh, the substrata of what we call intergenerational trauma. It's this actual impact on a, a baby's nervous system from maternal stress because the mother has too much stress and it gets past a placental barrier and infects the child. So when, when that happens, we end up with a nervous system that can be underreactive or overreactive and basically doesn't, doesn't assess uh, uh, experiences for their amount of, of possible danger or threat in a way that, that is useful, um, which in turn creates more stress. So um, there's a wonderful new understanding through what we call polyvagal theory there are great um, videos that explain polyvagal theory, but basically it talks about how um, when our nervous, when we feel safe, our nervous system allows us to have experiences and come and go from people and make friends, and it has all sorts of modulating effects on our our uh, our our face can can change expression easily, our voice can be dynamic, uh, we can hear a full range of sounds. And uh, we can we can tolerate eye contact, and we can relate to others. When we feel threatened, uh, those things start to shut down, and we become a little bit less approachable. And when we experience trauma, which is when the nervous system is completely overwhelmed uh, by the situation, then we go into um, there's a couple of predictable states that we go into. And one of them is uh, we, we dissociate. Um, substance use is looked at as a form of dissociation. We go, um, we, we cannot, we can't, we literally can't hear voices in the human range. Uh, we lose the ability to change our facial expression. We shut down uh, a bunch of bodily functions. And what can happen is, is uh, basically our frontal cortex um, extracts itself from the situation and protects us, leaving behind our lizard brain, which can react impulsively and, and, uh, and, and violently um, in order to protect us in the, in the, in the um, context of keeping us safe. 
And the reason I'm saying all this is because this stress reaction, this, this overwhelmed stress reaction, uh, helps us to understand a whole lot of behaviors of people when they are facing stress and facing trauma as symptoms rather than as um, antisocial behaviors and things that are are just um, you know might come from from poor uh, poor socialization. So Renee Renee Linklater. Um, came up with a term in her book, Decolonizing Trauma Work, which is ethnostress. And she defines ethnostress as a reply to the lack of predictability and cultural strangeness of the wounds inflicted by the colonizers. It's a response pattern of hopelessness and powerlessness. Uh, it embodies intergenerational trauma and those effects. And it, instead of uh, calling these symptoms and, and problems, um, they're, they're, they're the result of spiritual injury. They cause soul sickness, um, wounding, and ancestral hurt. And so that, to me, seems like a really reasonable definition of, of trauma. And I will, um, I will add this to Lewis's slides so that we can continue with the, we can, if we're going to be sharing the slide set, we can, uh, we can have that in there. And so basically, there's a, a new paradigm for looking at trauma, um, which has been emerging actually as a result of work with the Australian Aboriginals. And it's, it's called um, power threat, the power threat meaning framework. And the power threat meaning framework is um, a paradigm shift in mental health. It, it kind of takes into account what we now know about how our nervous system reacts under stress. And it is uh, a way of looking at the operation of power, um, biological power, embodied power, coercive power, legal, economic, material, ideological, social, personal power, the threat of the negative operation of power on the person and the meaning produced by uh, the social and cultural discourse um, in, in how we uh, experience that power, what it means to us, and, and what ends up to be our threat-induced re threat responses to this power situation. And so really what they're saying, um, and, I, and this, is, this is part of this indigenous perspective of trauma, is that we cannot look at trauma as something resident in an individual in keeping with what Lewis has been talking about, about community and about illness arising in community and in that context, we have to look at, at, uh, at, 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 at trauma as a function of this ecological uh, perspective, of this power, threat, and meaning in terms of, 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 of how we are able to move in the world and what kinds of things are social, culturally allowed to be done to us and what that might mean. So it's really taking it out of this idea of, of an individual being you know, resilient enough to overcome and turning it into the idea of having a community impact, having a community impact on, on um, recovery as well and engaging with community. A lot of the work that I, I do at the moment is I work for the Wabanaki Confederacy, I work for the uh, for a center for uh, people from the five tribes that are local, and I work in the harm reduction program. So most of my work is trauma work and working with people with substance issues. And um, as and substance in this model is looked at as 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 a dissociative response, as a way to get away from the discomfort of feelings and the discomfort of of uh, of living in this in this form of oppression. So it really raises some very good questions about how do we how do we bring healing to people who are suffering in this way. In, and a lot of traditional mental health treatment tends to, you know, build strengths, try to build the resources, try to, you know, encourage resiliency. And we're really looking at, at um, trying to build a community, um, a, a kind of survival community that can, and, and looking at telling new stories, telling stories of life experience being um, an, an urban Native American in this, in this uh, population 
and uh, and how much we can contribute through um, re-identifying and really looking at the story of trauma through a lens of respect. It's very easy to indict people um, with a with a kind of moral failing for um, for for some of the things that are properly seen as symptoms for some of the things that are properly signs of, of soul distress and are manifesting in, in, in ways and for what is properly manifesting as, as a kind of rage that, um, that can be easily and racially profiled as, as antisocial, but is in fact coming from that very deep place of this ethno stress model. So uh, we're really looking at trauma treatment from a social justice perspective and looking for ways to integrate um, integrate our people into into the community setting and also embracing you know two-eyed seeing really matters here because because of the foot in two cultures impact where you're you're off in a not not in the homelands not on the reservation but they're part of the of the uh, downtown world and part of the culture from from their homelands and so it's really how do people find a way to walk in both worlds. And it's a really tricky negotiation and it seems completely understandable that people would be bewildered by how the processes work. And uh, it comes out in, in addiction. It comes out especially in the context of, of children, of, of how what's happening to the children that they're raising and trying to kind of really take care of that generation and take care of the, of the kids who are kind of, you know, caught in this in this constellation of forces as well and teach them how to negotiate those things so um that's that's the piece that that um the the, the interesting pieces of of nervous system response to trauma is readily available um on youtube if you're interested and i can send out resources on this this way of looking at it um, Lewis, do you want to take it from here? Okay, I wanted you to tell one more story about the elder who told you that we're spirit beings come to walk in a physical world. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, I was taught that we're spirit beings coming to walk in a physical world, and we choose the life that we're going to walk into when we when we come to Earth. And we um and and we sometimes get halfway through that life that we've chosen and we we think what what on earth was i thinking this is ridiculous i have no idea what to do why didn't anybody tell me and we cry out for support from from um from our community from our community of spirit beings and one thing that's really beautiful about this is it's actually an idea that's echoed in the bhagavad gita where uh, a goddess comes to earth to walk in a human body and they say, what's it like? And uh, she says, oh, my, my movements are so slow because I have these feet and my, my thoughts are so slow because I have this brain. And I think it really speaks to that kind of ideological tension that we experience between our wishes for ourselves and the obstacles that we face through just being human and being with other humans in a in a human world the, the human body and the human psyche are are imperfect versions of wetware and uh, they don't always um they don't always help us to address um address the things that happen to us or the way we'd like to respond and i think um, especially in a situation where there's been um, a lot of, of disempowerment through racially identifying people. Um, a lot of people take responsibility in themselves for things that are properly attributed to circumstances. And um, I was once taught by a professor that we call this the fundamental attribution error. But um, it's very easy for people who have um, the... Um, the uh, Aroostook band of Maliseet, I think it's the Hol or the Holton band of Maliseet, um, their original tribal land given to them by the town of Holton was the town dump. And that is where they were invited to set up their tents and people would walk by and throw garbage and be uh, extremely offensive. So when you're coming from that kind of perception, 
um, working with the shame and and the uh, that disempowerment is really important. So that a- aspect of respecting somebody else's perspective and respecting a, a more spiritual value in healing um, becomes a question of survival for some people to find a story that has has hope embedded in it as opposed to um, you know economics or functionalism. We wanted to so keeping with two eyed seeing, there's some research, uh, scientific research that echoes indigenous beliefs. And one of our favorite studies is about speaker listener neurocoupling. And this shows um, how the same areas of the brain light up in a speaker telling a story as light up in a listener hearing the story. And so it's evidence for auditory mirror neurons and it it results in a theory of empathy which is that if i really listen carefully to you i'm going to feel what you're feeling because my brain is going to synchronize with your brain and the brain, the areas in my brain will be activated just as they are in your brain which gets back to the power of the deep listening, which appears to exist in almost every indigenous culture. So um, also the idea that it's the social brain hypothesis. It's the idea that the environment changes the brain far more profoundly than the internal environment. So the social external environment is much more important for brain function than the internal chemical environment. And, you know, in psychiatry, it explains why you give a drug and it works for a year, year and a half, and then it stops working. Because if the outer world doesn't change, the brain adapts. And now it's the same as it was, but with the drug which makes it really hard to take away the drug, which of course the pharmaceutical companies love. And, and then you either have to increase the dose or change drugs or you know, all of that kind of stuff. So outside shapes inside as opposed to inside shapes outside. And um, so we, we wanted to mention some examples of Two wide seeing on this is a project on the Eskasoni First Nation, which is where Albert Marshall comes from, and um, this is near Sydney, Nova Scotia, and um, so they talk about making traditional cultural services equally available to youth as conventional mental health services, and. Um, So youth are given the choice between standard conventional mental health services or indigenous methods of improving well-being or any combination that they want to use. So uh, here's another study of two-eyed seeing. This is from my old stomping grounds, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And it's about using elders to interpret research. talk about doing a meta-analysis or a scoping study or a narrative review. So these guys headed by Colleen Dell bring the elders in to participate in that whole process of evaluating research. And and then um, here's an example from Northeastern Ontario um, of blending Aboriginal and conventional methods to treat intergenerational trauma among people with substance abuse. So um, so this is happening. The point is this is happening around the world that people are being offered um, traditional, cultural, conventional, biomedical, 
or whatever combination they choose to create. And where I come back to is the power of story. And so um, within indigenous cultures, storytelling is a part, it's a crucial part of community and family life. And the stories hold the wisdom, the stories hold the knowledge. And if, if you wanna understand a culture, listen to its stories. So um, how, how do we intervene with storytelling? What is a storytelling intervention? And so what we wanna do is to identify people who can serve as storytelling superstars. And we want to enable them to tell their stories in a way that gets recorded and shares with other, shared with other people who look and sound just like them. Now, uh, there's a researcher who did this very study in South Carolina among um, black people with uncontrolled hypertension. And he found that it was dramatically successful in reducing blood pressure. He's, he's recently repeated this study among rural people in Northern Vietnam got the same results. Different looking superstars, storytelling superstars, but the same results on blood pressure. And so his point is that, you know, nurture your storytellers and use them to good advantage. So um, also another indigenous principle, social engineering. Work with the whole community if you want to change an individual. So um, that external experience changes the brain more powerfully than anything you can imagine. And, and this, of course, in the mainstream culture comes from Hubble and Weasel. And, and they did mean things to cats, well, to kittens, actually which is why maybe his last name is Weasel. But anyway, um, what they did was they sewed kittens' eyes shut early, soon after they were born. And they found that the brain took over the visual cortex for other purposes. But the brain said, oh, well, I don't need this, so I'm gonna use it for something else. And that the typical visual connections just didn't happen because you need external stimulation in order for the connections to be formed in the brain. And it, it's certainly true with substance use. If, if you want to stop using substances, you need a community that doesn't use substances. If you, we found this consistently in Saskatchewan, I worked in the far north uh, in, on fly-in fly reserves, they're called, where you, you can't get out except by airplane. And um, so we found that if you sent people down south, by down south, we mean Saskatoon or Regina, not Florida. <laughs> but anyway, if you send people down south for 28-day programs and they came back to the reserve, nothing good came of it because they came right back into the context from which they left of people using drugs. And so it was much more effective to create a community in place, to create a recovery community right there in Stony Rapids or Uranium City or Black Lake. And um, that worked much better for recovery from substance use than sending people down south and then shipping them back up to their communities. So um, the brain changes from outside. And another really important thing that 
every indigenous elder knows. And by the way, one of my favorite elders in South Dakota, when I was telling him about quantum physics, you know, and I was just waxing poetic about all this stuff, he said, well, isn't it nice that they're finally catching up with the Lakota? So anyway, um, audience effect. So if you're in a group of people having an experience, the degree of gene induction is dramatically greater than if you have the same experience by yourself. And that's true if you're a cockroach, a fish, a bird, a monkey, a gerbil, or a human. It's been studied in all of these species. And so, um, so being with others who are like you and having an experience causes it to be incredibly more powerful in terms of gene expression, how it changes you, how it causes epigenetic modifications in the genome. And, and of course, it turns out these days that epigenetics is so much more important than conventional genetics, that there are very few conventional genetic diseases. Huntington's disease, one gene. Um, cystic fibrosis, one gene. Um, well, actually several genes, but a small number. But most illnesses are affected by a whole bunch of genes and not by their sequence, but by their shape. And so it turns out that experience changes the shape of our genes. And that is transmitted across generations, which is why intergenerational trauma is so powerful and so profound because you get the experiences, you get the results of the trauma of your parents without really knowing what the experiences were consciously. And that could make you feel a little crazy. And so, um, so you know, elders knew this without having to do the science, indigenous knowledge, but we've got the science now. And we know that being together for an experience of healing or trauma is much more powerful than being alone. So social interactions are an incredible controller of brain function on, in every species studied. So getting to the end, cause it's almost time for the break. <laughs> So how do we restore balance when we see with two eyes? So we would be more relational and less procedural. I've learned a new term for that. More relational and less transactional. We would tell more stories and see things as stories and make fewer diagnoses. Use more verbs and fewer nouns. We would work from the bottom up, from people up to doctors, instead of the top down, from experts telling we people what to do. We would be more acknowledging of suffering, more capable of bearing witness to suffering, and less focused on treating symptoms and conditions. We would probably be more qualitative and we would probably do less randomized control trials. Most randomized control trials, by the way, show absolutely nothing. You know, it's, it's a terrible return on investment. We would do more community-based participatory research and less hierarchical imposition by experts. And we would be more aware of the politics of evidence-based medicine, which privileges those in power and disenfranchises those who are not in power. So, um, and just a quick story about um, someone that I saw for a consult. So one of the residents where I work had tried um, just every medication you can imagine for a young woman's headaches, migraine headaches. And so 
in desperation, he referred her to me. And so I had a captive medical student. And so I made her do a life story interview to get this person's life story. And as we looked at the life story, it was just totally obvious that there was this incredible conflict between the obligations of motherhood and her wanting to pursue her career. And so that led to a series of conversations. And um, we didn't give her any different drugs. In fact, we told her, well, they didn't work. Maybe you should stop taking them, which she did. And uh, as we explored, like how, how to negotiate this conflict of values between motherhood and career, um, her headaches disappeared. And um, we didn't, you know, give her any drugs. So there's an example of relational versus transactional. So I think probably that's the end of my exposition. Barbara, do you have any final words to no, offer? I, I, just that I think that, that um, you know, this is a, a, a really um, leads us to understand trauma as something that we all can contribute to the healing of, from. Right. And, and we all have it. Some of us more of it than others. So we yeah. all know what it is. And it's our duty to help each other to negotiate it and to, to heal it and to resolve it. So um, that's my last word. So with that, I will say I'm done. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you for letting me talk. Thank you, Lewis and Barbara. Uh, uh, just beautiful presentations from both of you. So we have, uh, number of questions and comments. And I just like to invite people if you have responses in, in the spirit of um, allowing for discourse, uh, communication back and forth at a deeper level, I, um, you know, you might try uh, jumping in, but just remember to mute yourself again when you're, you're no longer speaking. So the first question, um, we have is from Mark. Hi, Mark. Hi. Um, and why don't you go ahead and restate your, your question, Mark? My, my question really is uh, where, firstly, I want to thank Lewis and Barbara for their fabulous presentation. It was very well put together and much appreciated. Mm -hmm. And really, I think as I reflect upon your presentation, it's, it's really about how do we engage with the dominant biomedical culture? Can at his beginning talked about uh, our problem, the genesis of the new school as a reaction to fundamentalism. Fundamentalism is based in fear. And I will, I have had many, many experiences over the decades uh, with fear from the biomedical dominant culture when you show them something. And something as simple as lifestyle changes that are, aren't wacky at all and your pharmacist just could not see that. And you uh, put out a wonderful presentation uh, as a good professor would, but it seems to me that this data-driven, evidence-based approach doesn't engage the dominant medical culture. And how can we bring a two-eyed seeing both sides to bringing this in? And I'll just briefly say that when I, I'm a medical doctor who has been doing osteopathy for more than 30 years after my fellowship training. Uh, my uh, three chairmen, including one that was my resident at one point, uh, did not want any training in this and my specialties in physical medicine. When we look at osteopathy, I know the New England School in Maine is an osteopathic school. The expansion of osteopathy has gone from the early 70s of seven campuses to more than 45, and yet only about 2% of those uh, osteopathic students actually have a sense of what osteopathy is, which is another way of viewing things in a broader context than the narrow evidence-based way. So how do we engage when you have good data, but it doesn't shift anything? 
That's what I'm asking. Well, I don't, I don't have any better answer than you. I can say that we probably just have to keep talking and keep writing. And, um, you know, it was Max Planck who said, science changes one funeral at a time. So it may just take time. Maybe it won't happen at all. But I, I also think of Thomas Merton who said, you should always do the right thing even if you're sure that it's not going to work. So we just keep talking. Uh, I was, I mean, talking about the pharmacist, I was just flabbergasted because I just thought, I mean, she knows me. Why did she think I sent her this thing that said, look what the lifestyle change did, you know? But she just didn't get it at all. So I guess we just keep talking and writing. And I mean, you know, the more we talk and write, the more we influence students. And, and really the students are the future. So, um, so we just have to keep doing what we're doing, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next uh, question is from Ryan. Um, so again, I like everyone, I'm gonna thank you for Really, I wish my hand was faster at writing. <laughs> so lots of wonderful information and, and good um, good dialogue there. Um, I kind of have a question. I, I am not a licensed psychologist, so I'm coming at it kind of as an outsider, but I do uh, healing work. Um, and many of my clients come to me, they do have various forms of traumas, um, most of which, uh, some of them, many of which are beyond my skills, so I certainly refer them out. But there are some things that are, are far less so. Um, and one of the, when you were talking about storytelling, one of the, the major stories that I hear, particularly from my female clients, um, has a lot to do with their being powerless and then also hopeless. And so one of the, um, one of the techniques I was taught is to have the person tell their story up to the point where that strong emotional reaction would occur and then have them envision a different reaction and anchor that with colors or sometimes people don't think in colors so they'll use something else. Um, and that's had some effect and some benefits. I, you know, I don't know how that would work on something significant, but you know, most of the traumas that I deal with are not that significant. They're, they're more childhood, you know, um, I wanted to play outside and mommy wouldn't let me kind of a thing. Um, but I, I am curious on the storytelling and, and how uh, we can more effectively use that in just even the life coaching and spiritual coaching that I do. Well, it seems from the studies that I've read, it seems that stories are the most effective way to convey information in an emotional manner. And so um, there's studies of, of um, there's a study from Arizona of <clears throat> Hispanic women talking about m mammograms. And it turned out that that was like, hugely successful in increasing the rate of mammograms as opposed to scary posters about breast cancer. And um, so I think that um, we, we just, we negotiate our world through telling each other stories and, and you're probably doing that when you do your work. You're, you're telling small vignettes. And, and sometimes we tell long vignettes, but mostly we tell small vignettes. And all of these are about persuasion, right? They're about um, encouraging people to, to pursue a certain course of action. 
and you know advertising got here before us so they've been writing about this for longer than we have because you know they want to make they want to persuade you to buy a ford instead of a chevy or vice versa so they've got to come up with a story that you'll incorporate that you'll absorb that tells you why a ford is better than a chevy and and they're spending a lot on figuring out that out mm. um so i don't know did i come close to sort of addressing your point well, i guess when i'm i'm so I really don't ever tell my clients what they should or shouldn't do. My job is really to just ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they'll try to nail me down to, well, what do you think? And of course, most of the times I just turn those questions right back around because that's, it's really not my life. So I'm not going to tell them what they need to do and not do. Um, but there are times that we will talk about some of the pros and cons. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, one young woman that I, uh, I shouldn't call her young. I don't know how old she is. Um, so one woman that I was working with, um, she she felt particularly, um, I'm going to call it, unempowered to pursue any dreams that she had, even though she was a very successful business person. She has her own um, business and, and lots of clients, especially um, celebrity clients. But she feels like she can't, do anything she's always afraid and I, her story talks about when she was a child and her mother and father having a very difficult marriage and of course her life being very troubled apparently she got kicked out of the house at age 16 so it was a little bit difficult um, and obviously I'm not qualified to deal with any of those nonetheless you know a client's talking about it so I just asked a lot of questions and I remember at one point asking her, so if you could change that, how would you change it, the story? You know, where, where would you intercede? And of course she said, well, it would never happen. I said, well, if it never happened, then you wouldn't have this. So if you were to happen, if you could go now as an adult back to your childhood and intercede, what would you make happen instead? And she came up with a really nice story of, you know, well, you know, this would happen. I, I, tell myself that this is mom and dad, it's not me, and you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then she said, and then I asked her, I don't know why, but I asked her what color or colors felt right about that. And she picked yellow, and I can't remember the other couple of colors. Um, and after that, the next session we had, which is, you know, again, it's a coaching session. She was telling me about how certain things have changed in her life, not necessarily related to her work, but and, you know, where she wanted it to go, but related to um, other people in her life. So I'm just trying to figure out how that might, I don't know if I want to do more of that or not, but I'm just trying to understand how does that storytelling fit with some of the research and things you've, you've understood? Because there isn't a big community here. It was just her and me on the phone. That's why I don't know if she's young or old, because we just do it over the phone, not, not Zoom. So Yeah. Well, I think you gave her the opportunity to find a metaphor and she ran with it. And, and you probably can't know how that worked, you know, because it has to do with her inner world or inner workings. I mean, her sort of pri maybe private is her invisible cognition processes you know but but when you said when you offered her the color then she made something of it and it, I think it's often the case that we tell someone a story and they get more out of it than we thought they would and different things out of it than we thought they would because it's all about what they do with it rather than what we meant for them to do with it. And so, um, you know, I, I think, well, yeah. yeah, that worked. So do it again, try some more, <laughs> you know. 
that was that's kind of what I was trying to get out of this. Is is that a good thing to do? I mean, you know, like I said, this is way outside of my area of expertise, but okay. Oh, thank you. All okay. right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Um, again, like everyone is saying hello, um, just really savoring every word. Um, and my question relates back to Barbara's comments about dissociation and addiction. And I was just musing for a minute, considering that perhaps if a story is too painful, you know, we can't speak it, we can't tell it, and we maybe that's when dissociation happens and we use. But I'd just love to know more about that. Um, it's just yeah. Word. We have, a, there's, a, so there's a couple of things. I, I just put a paper in the chat um, because I saw your question, and that's kind of the sciency version of it, talking about what they call alexithemia, which is this inability to connect with your emotions because they're too difficult. So, you know, we, we, we experience distress and because of whatever um, level of, of tolerance we have for, for stress, is, is interfered with. So there's, there are people who can tolerate, um, cannot tolerate a teacup handle being turned the wrong way. And there are people who are fine if the world is collapsing around them and we all fit in somewhere along there on a continuum. And it depends on our history and our, our current state and traumas that occur afterwards. And, you know, so it's biopsychosocial. So when we have intolerable feelings, when we're not used to being able to sit with distress, we develop ways of wanting to get out of that feeling of, of discomfort. And, you know, being able to know that you have emotions, if, if you're, you know, is such a wonderfully important part of mental health and, and really simple things like validation. You know, if somebody is, so we always say we validate the emotion, not necessarily the behavior. So, you know, we, we, don't, we don't validate you trying to run someone over with your truck, but we certainly validate the rage that you're feeling. And let's try to work on another way to, 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 to express it. So that feeling of, of um, just, you know, squirrely feeling and, and sitting with that feeling that, that of anywhere from, you know, kind of doom um, can be facilitated with alcohol. Alcohol makes you briefly feel better. So it's a maladaptive response, but it helps you to get out of that feeling state. And there's a, in the paper that I sent, there's a, a really solid correlation between people with developmental trauma. So there's a, um, PTSD is, is the, the result of exposure to um, life-threatening, life-taking, um, or sexual abuse or physical abuse. And um, it's very specific. If you're familiar with the diagnosis, it's got a lot of detail in it about how you can attribute it. There's another kind of trauma that is, um, is called developmental trauma or complex trauma. And back in the day, we used to have a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, which was this inability to connect with yourself, not having a strong feeling of yourself, needing everything to be externally sort of driven, but also this tremendous sense of mistrust and abandonment that led to kind of really um, crazy making, sorry to use the word crazy, but the, the, you know, survival behaviors that are extremely complicated because it's usually threat and coercion and, and immediate, you know, immediate arousal. And it's all about trying to feel safe and, you know, this feeling that it's life or death. And if you don't punch your way into safety, you won't feel safe. So it's a really complicated thing. And the treatment for it used to be um, what they call dialectical behavioral therapy, which really works because it's about distress tolerance, emotion management, interpersonal effectiveness and mindfulness. And it's really a program that says, slow down, bring your reactions down, learn to calm your nervous system, nurture yourself, and then begin to think about how to create allies in the world mm -hmm. in ways other than intimidating and threatening. And it, you know, the, the prediction was it would take anywhere from two to four years to help somebody along this pathway. And it was considered a personality disorder. So 
along comes Bessel van der Kolk, the trauma guy. And he starts looking at this and he goes, isn't, and, and, and also at the same time, um, the ACE study, the study that came up with the ad, uh, adverse childhood experience score, um, his name was Fabilio or something. I've got the paper anyway, that they, it was, um, it was actually looking at um, intractable obesity in a clinical population at Kaiser Permanente. There were, so he looked at 17,000 cases of intractable obesity and correlated them all to trauma and went like, oh, oh. And so then he invented this 10 measure scale. So that kind of thinking and also um, Bessel van der Kolk studies about, about nervous system arousal and Porges's studies about polyvagal theory all started to paint this picture of what's happening is your nervous system is messed up. It's stuck on high alert and you're doing all kinds of things to get out of that feeling of anywhere from discomfort to flat out panic um, that you feel because your world feels just completely unstable. And it's a really neat theory that sort of maps into attachment and how we learn how to, attachment is really, how do we learn how to bond? How do we learn how to create a bond with another human being, creating trust and feeling safe enough to connect? And like I was saying before, um, when, you're, when you're in a traumatized state, you actually lose the ability to connect to other people. Your face shuts down, you can't even hear the human voice range. So when we look at, at, at you know, ways of, of feeling better, and that kind of trauma happens as a result of chaotic childhood experiences, no nurturing, um, abandonment. Um, you know, I have clients who tell me, yeah, when I was feeling upset as a child at age five, my dad handed me a joint, you know, and, and you know, when I was 11 years old, he, he gave me a glass of whiskey because, you know, we were, we were up to a different level. And, and that kind of thing creates this, it, it, it's an impossible puzzle because if you think about it, you don't have a very developed brain. You're trying to figure out how to make your way safely in the world, and you're being exposed to completely bonkers signals about what that might look like. And it's really just a question of what actually provides a safe space. You know, when, you, when you're raising a child, you're raising a nervous system. And how do you teach a child's nervous system how to regulate themselves in the world and how to detect safety and detect threat? So if you're on high alert the whole time because your life is chaotic, your parents are chaotic, you don't have boundaries, you don't have anyone reflecting experience, you don't have anyone to process events with, and, you, and you're just getting these really weird messages about what might work that, 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 and that don't turn out to work. So now you're, you can't trust your caregivers because the things they're suggesting are not working. You don't have enough frontal cortex to kind of make an assessment and decide what might work better or, you know, do all that work. And so you, you, you develop defense mechanisms and mechanisms that are coping strategies that just take the pain off and take the edge off. And so they're really looking at that and looking at the correlation of that to alcohol use and this, this not a, unable to feel your feelings because, you know, being either from messages about that they're not appropriate or a misunderstanding of what feelings are, or just like the idea that they don't go anywhere anyway. And, and, you know, you can get, you can get hurt if you have a feeling because you might get hit. So that kind of developmental trauma um, that happens at key periods, especially at, you know, key, key moments is, is what's contributing to this complete dysregulation as you're older and you're reaching for, you know, something that makes you feel calmer and substances just really fill that bill. And um, our friend, we have a, a friend in Australia. He's, he's a nurse practitioner, psychiatric nurse practitioner there. Um, uh, I think last year or the year before he won psychiatric nurse practitioner of the year in Australia. And, and he has been looking at this power threat meaning framework and he came up with the term dissociocotic and he, he has a very strong argument that psychosis is a form of dissociation. It's just literally getting yourself into another world. And, you know, that's where the rich metaphors come in. So I think it's useful to, I mean, I, I work with uh, people with substance use disorders and co-occurring mental health issues. And I have not met anyone who doesn't have a co-occurring mental health issue who has a powerful substance use disorder. And I haven't, um, and I think looking at the kinds of things 
that trouble people like, you know, and, and I, I'm a bit basic. I go, how is this person making friends? Who's their supporters? Do they know how to talk to other people? And I honestly find so often that making social connection is the hardest thing and something that they're finding impossible to do. And they're giving off signals, they're agitated, they're, you know, and they get, they get the reciprocity that that invites. And so it's really difficult to be in their world. And then they have, you know, various maladaptive strategies. So, you know, it really seems like um, regardless of what, you know, the chicken and egg of substance use are co-occurring, um, it's really useful to think about this from a trauma perspective and say something shot this thing, this poor system, you know, all to hell, and we need to slowly start to rebuild it. So helping people know how to self-calm, helping people engage in self-care, helping people even just, you know, teaching psychoeducation about what it is, what the trauma states look like and what, you know, the fact that you can't, you know, I had a couple in my office saying, he's not listening to me. And we looked at what was going on and we're going like, is it possible that he's triggered and it's a trauma response? And he literally is shutting down those, you know, those, those mid range, you know, signals. It's possible that he literally doesn't hear, you know, it doesn't, I, I'm not going to say you can use that as excuse with your partner all the time, but there is a feature of that that's involved there. So when we look at these things, we can see that simple interventions like listening to somebody, validating, helping them become more comfortable with the idea that they even have feelings and that they might be relevant and useful. You know, I like um, Yak Panksep's idea. The He's the one who wrote... Um, uh, uh, what is it? Affective neuroscience. And he talks about, you know, feelings as signals in our seeking system about how our strategies are working out towards goals. So I often use that to get people to, to, to just kind of go to a non-scary place, introducing the idea of feelings. You know, you can have feelings and they're just signals. Don't worry about it. It's, it's like, you know, it's like a valve. And then we'll get to the other parts of them later. But, you know, it just is. Um, so that's, that's the kind of alcohol and dissociation. It's a, it's a trauma response. It's a way to say, I can't tolerate this state. And, you know, the luck of the draw is what, what, what substance you turn to, um, uh, you know, and, and, and um, we, 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 we have a right, we have a lot of, of meth in our population, in our, well, in, in all populations, a lot of methamphetamine. Um, we use Suboxone in the clinic, but there's also, uh, an extremely active trade in Xanax. Um, mm. So, um, because these are controlled and you can't get them prescribed anymore. And, you know, so um, yeah, that it, so it, it just makes all kinds of sense to me. But as I said, I put the reference in the paper so that, uh, yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, well, the chat box, those of you that are monitoring it, it's really filling up. So my apologies in advance if we can't get to everyone's uh, questions or comments. Um, so um, Nicole, would you like to uh, go next? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and I, I, I really love this conversation. I love the questions. And Carly, thanks for your question also because this is something that I talk about regularly with students and so forth. And I wanted to just um, just ask a little bit about a lot of what you said made me reflect and it's constantly made me reflect on how we individualize problems in a very particular way um, that caused problems later for us within the context of community. So, for example, I was thinking about a client, my own time in community mental health and um, feeling compelled to leave community mental health because I felt like the problems were so individualized and they were so reduced to these um, pharmaceutical solutions or individualized problems that we are abdicating our responsibility to to actually care for other people. So I guess my question, I, well, I should go back and say, for example, um, you know, I, you know, as a clinical director or as a program manager, we're trained to really have very 
very specific protocols in conventional community mental health. That could be just mainstream addictions counseling. You need you could go to inpatient therapy or just fix your problems or just be abstinent, you know, without really having the support of a healthy community. So what kinds of alternatives would you recommend um, for for something like inpatient or for something like very, like that highly individualized approach to problems that are largely, you know, ecological, like socio-ecological to some degree. <clears throat> that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's, it's a tremendous uphill swim, upstream swim. And because all of the payment structures are individual based, and, um, you know, sort of community organizing certainly doesn't pay well. And um, so we're really fighting against the grain of the culture. And I, again, I, I don't know how to solve this, but I know things that can be done, like community talking circles. Um, you know, community discussion groups. Um, and we've, we've been doing some things in, in the communities about opiate use disorder and just getting people out to talk about it. You know, and we've gotten a really wide range of response, as you might imagine, from, you know, people learn it from their parents they're just doing what their parents and grandparents did to, you know, the moral weakness argument that, you know, they're doing it because of poor morals or they're just weak um, to everything you can imagine. And what I've observed is that when people talk together, something changes. You know, and, and there's another another idea I've been exploring is the idea, I think art installations really help. And I've been reading some literature on, there was a project at Penn State um, where they, they, three huge screens in a small dark cocoon room with 30 seats and you and speakers everywhere and you're just immersed in the in this surround sound surround video about attitudes toward aging and attitudes toward old people and um they the researchers found that people change their attitudes toward old people as a result of sitting in this art installation they didn't change their attitudes about aging. Everyone still thought that sucked. But, but they started to feel differently about older people. And I, I think maybe more art. We forget about art and art installations and, and, and sort of communication through art, you know, using art to engage people. Um, and I think that that I think what I like about art too is that it, it 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 shared experience of being around art. You know, it's it's a good it's a good way to have a meaningful conversation. Um, and and I wanted to just add that in our community, um, I think that conventional treatment. A lot of people who have substance use involvement are also involved in the justice system and boy is that ever an individualizing place if you don't count the indian gang that is in the prison system here but you know it, it's not really it, it, it's not really a collective way of 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 approaching the world although i i like to argue for trauma and foreign prisons but what i'm seeing which is really interesting is some of our people who are were in the harm reduction program are, are, are reaching out to their cousins and, you know, there's this little network forming 
um, we had very few sober supports. We had very few, there's, there's, it's a longer story, but we, there were very few robust sober supports for people or mutual support communities, but I'm seeing this little thread. So um, I, I think that, I think what Lewis said, talking, just people talking to each other gets somewhere. It, it, takes people somewhere. And in a way, they used to say that inpatient wasn't ideal anyway, because it takes you out of community to get fixed, and then you're plonked back in with all the same social struggles that you had before. So in a way, somehow, you know, finding ways to, to form bonds in the community for mutual support might be stronger than, you know, going away to the farm where everybody wants to go around here because it's, you know, a farm, they got horses and it's a nice place to go recover, but you know, then you come back. Um, so I, I, that's my two cents. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Lisa, music to your ears, huh? The art, you're up. Lisa? Yeah. Are you Hi. there? Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> yeah, art music to my ears for sure. I had a many things, um, but I'm going to be really specific. My question was about healing communities um, like the uh, ones you've, you've spoken of that um, are in Southeast Alaska for the Southeast Alaskan Native communities up there. So we can speak a bit to that, but we'll refer you to people in Alaska. Um, you know, I don't even need to take up my time to hear some really, really cool questions that people are asking. Well, I, I, I think they're relevant. Mm. I think what's exciting in Alaska is the cultural revitalization that's happening. And um, we go to Kodiak um, when we can, when COVID lets us. Um, and the elite people there have, are just going through this incredible rediscovery of their cultural practices and implementing them in summer camps in, for kids and adults in ceremonies and music. And um, I, I sus they tell us that the, on the mainland, there's groups that were more, had less European contact and are more intact. Um, they tell us that the Russians were nicer than the Americans and that, um, that they had to go I think it was to Finland to see some of their amazing cultural artifacts that had been removed and put in a museum over there. But they're doing all this and our, 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 con our main contact is a professor in the School of Nursing, University of Alaska at Anchorage School of Nursing, Margaret Draskovich, although she just got married, so it's Margaret Mete now. But we'll, if you email us separately, we'll connect you and Margaret. And, you, and she knows all these people in Southeast Alaska. They all know each other, as you might imagine. And, and they can tell you so much more than we can. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, Rolf. Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Yeah, nice to, nice to be here. Here, you know, I, I missed the first part. So, but uh, the discussion that's been going on has been really rewarding. I work in in Norway with mainly, not mainly, only with refugees. So it's not like uh, indigenous peoples, like probably you are, but still uh, people who belong to different ethnic minorities in their, you know, home country, and there are some parallels. So my question was that uh, if you have any not quick fixes, I realize that's not uh, very realistic, but uh, for groups of people who have been uh, subjected to, uh, you know, intergenerational trauma, you know, this has been passed on from one generation to the next. 
And then this individual has suffered quite a lot of new personal individual trauma. And if there are anyone who uh, would like to kind of talk about uh, any, any good ideas in how this, well, I, I, I wrote rehab in my question, but uh, maybe that's not the right word, but just to add on the question, you know, my experience, I'm a physiotherapist, so, you know, the gateway is the body, but I, I realize maybe 75, 85% of my work is now conversation and listening. So uh, I realize how powerful that can be. But uh, anyone uh, in this panel would, would, you know, take this further, I would be, I would appreciate it very much. You know, um, I'm trying to, th to remember the place where I read this paper, but I read a paper about um, Syrian refugees working using art, using an art pro, making art together with Syrian women, traumatized women Syrian refugees, and mm -hmm. and it was wildly helpful, and um, if you if you email me. I, It'll give me the time to look up where I, where I, I file that paper away, because it was uh, terribly inspiring, and um, done with virtually no money, as you might imagine, in a refugee camp. Yeah. Yeah. Was it the embroidery one? No, but that's another one. That's another one. There seems to be more than just one. So I think I think art. You know, I there was a study, a, there was a community um, project, community art project in London, uh, in Brixton, South London, which is a notoriously um, tricky area. And there were two rival groups. I think it was it was either Hindus and Sikhs or. I can't remember who the two divergent groups were. And they got, they, they invited, they did a thing about fabric. They, they got people to bring in fabric that meant something to them and talk about the fabric. And it turned into this amazing project where they created these big fabric sculptures. They made a sort of mosaic of, of, of fabrics or uh, in different groups and people brought in denim and traditional fabrics and and it turned into this wonderful conversation um about history and belonging and, and being an immigrant so I, I think there's some some incredible value in uh, in in people doing art together quilting yeah well i i can add something to that because uh, i know this uh, psychologist originally from Colombia, who's worked in the U.S. for a while, and now he's back in Colombia working with a reconciliation process between uh, ex-guerrillas, military people, etc. His name is Hector Aristizaba, and he uses theater, the theater of the oppressed, or, you know, different theater techniques. Mm -hmm. And we tried some of those things for a group of uh, refugees in Bergen, Norway, from the DRC, and you know the idea is to to show something from your own culture uh, like dance song or uh, anything so we we made a or they made in with our with us as directors like uh, three small pieces of uh, theater you know happening like uh, during two or three hours just showing some of the resources that this group has so, of course, you know, this being able to, to use art in any, any way, I think it's, it's also very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. so. And also, I think it's, there's something really important about getting the people themselves who need and want the services together to, to talk about what they could use, what would help them the most and what they would want to do. You know, that sort of participatory development of interventions 
that that in which those who will receive the interventions participate in their design, their conceptualization and their design. And, and I think that's why it's a mistake to design programs and I, you know, isolated from the people who will use them, that they need to be part of the design process. Mm -hmm. And that could involve art too. Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. It was uh, nice to, uh, to hear your comments. Mm -hmm. nice. I'm looking at my clock and it's, we're right at the, just about at 12.15. Shall we stop at this point or take one more question or shall we just leave it here? Uh, there's so much more. I'm certainly, I know I'm, I'm speaking for myself, but I may be sharing for the rest of us. We'd love to have both of you come back again for perhaps a longer venue. Sure, we'd love to. If that's yeah. possible. Um, maybe even, maybe someday in person. <laughs> what, what was that word again? In person, you remember that word? You know, remember hey, when we got to hey. <laughs> share a meal together and, share you know. Oh. Well together. Yeah, although I, I do, I do want to say that I, I am thankful to Zoom because I have connected with so many more people from so many far-flung places right. since COVID started than I ever did before. And I hope we keep connecting because it's because it it's it's a democratizing agent in that we don't have to have travel funds yeah. to connect with each other. And so so I want to thank Zoom. <laughs> maybe maybe I ought to thank the COVID virus, you know, for doing something for us as well as bad to us. Yeah. Not, you know, like ectomics, you know, yeah. viruses are good and bad. Um, but it would be fun to, to be with you guys in person. So uh, I want to, on behalf of the new school and the and Nicole's group, um, I want to thank you all for participating. We, we do have probably about a half a dozen people who are international that have called in uh, and that, that have been part of this event as well. So we have an international following today. So, and I think that's a testament to what the two of you uh, have to offer and keep up the good work. And thank you. Much and thank thank you. you for inviting us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. I have one more reminder. Um, again, thanks. Thank you, Lewis and Barbara. And thanks. Thanks everyone for actually attending. I just want to remind if you're remind you for those of you who are in Washington state, um, return your evaluations to me for your CEUs. Also, even if you don't need CEUs, we want to hear your feedback. So absolutely send us um, your feedback on the presentation. And if you want to be added to the mailing list of the new school or for the Society for Anthropology of Consciousness, send me an email too and I'll forward that information to the necessary parties. So that's my shtick and thank you so much. Mm -hmm.